couple quick announcements, and then I'd like to speak to the mothers, if I may. Um, the, uh, the Garcias, uh, they, as you, many of you probably know, if not most of you by now, that they have had their baby, uh, Zelda is her name, Zelda. Yeah, and so if they're watching from home, we love you guys, proud of you, and uh, praying for you. And with that, there's a meal train, um, as we usually try to do for, for folks. And so Jenny Haug, she has, if, would you raise your hand, please? She has the information. There's a link there. You can sign up and, and get on the, the schedule to provide a meal. So we encourage you to please do that. It's always a huge blessing. I know I've been on the receiving end of that, and so I know very well just what a blessing that can be. What a great practical way to, uh, to show love. So I want to encourage you to do that. And then, uh, again, just week by week, continuing to remind you of our pizza ministry, Doughboys Ministries, uh, the, the Bridge Brothers. They make these, uh, just everything is totally from scratch, gourmet deliciousness uh, out back, and so in the, in the brick oven back there. So you can, uh, you can sign up here. You can order pizzas as you're going out the door. There's an online format. They can tell you how to access that. Uh, but we appreciate the folks who are weekly coming out on Friday evenings and just kind of making a Friday night festivity of it for the family. And uh, we have a lot of fun out here, a lot of activity on the, the campus. And so uh, it's just cool. So I want to encourage you guys, if you haven't been participating in that, uh, please uh, consider doing so. All right. Well, it is Mother's Day. And I'd like to uh, read read a scripture and then... Just share some thoughts, if I may. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, <clears throat> I just want to say that Timothy is one of my favorite characters in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament. I hate to say character. He's, he's a, a real person. We know that historically. And he has uh, an incredible place in the New Testament. He is frequently mentioned and uh, there's so much that we, we know about this man. He was a man that God used greatly. <clears throat> he was a man who struggled. He was fearful. He was timid, um, emotional. He had stomach problems, it would seem. Uh, it, it was not an easy road for him to be um, a companion of the Apostle Paul. But man, he served so very faithfully to the very end of his life. And he just pops up over and over throughout the New Testament. And Paul just says some of the most wonderful things about this young brother. That at one point, he said, there was, I have no one like Timothy. There's no one like him. No one like-minded. Everyone else, they care for not the things of Christ, but not so with Timothy. He's given his life to the things of Christ. And he serves sincerely from the heart. And so I could go on and on about all of these things regarding Timothy. But what I want to show you in 2 Timothy is... Paul, in, in a very real way, traces this back, Timothy's character back. He says in verse 3 of 2 Timothy, he says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. And so he says, Timothy, you're a man of God, you're a man of faith, but you know what, I, that, that same faith that is in you, I remember seeing that in your grandmother and in your mother, just wonderful faithfulness, faith in God, love towards God and the saints, and that same faith I know I am confident is now in you, sincerely so. I just always loved that. Uh, when, when Paul touched down there in Timothy's hometown, uh, we believe that Timothy came to faith in Christ, most likely his mom and his grandmother. They were Jewish, and so they were worshipers of the living God. And when they heard the gospel, God opened their hearts. They trusted Christ for salvation. Paul was stoned there in that town, beaten with rocks. i clarify that in our, our modern day and age. Um, and he departed, as you would expect, but he came back through a couple years later, and now Timothy was, was a little more solid in the faith, faith and he departed with, with Paul and went on missionary journeys and just great works with Paul, and he had a great reputation there, and Paul, in a lot of ways, I think, ties us back to Timothy's upbringing, 
the influence that Timothy's grandmother and mom had in his own life. And that's amazing to me. And Paul, Paul uh, says, his, says such in the, in the Word of God there. And so that just encourages me. And I wanted to, to read that and kind of start there. And then I just wanted to share a couple thoughts, if I may. First off, I just want to honor and acknowledge the mothers here today. The mothers, grandmothers, um, we love you. You know, we really appreciate you. We see what you're doing, uh, your love for your family. And, uh, you know, I hope that you are honored and acknowledged more than just one day out of the year. You know, um, I, I hope that in my home, Mother's Day happens many more times than just one day out of the year. You know, that we are honoring and acknowledging the mothers and loving and blessing them as much as we can, you know. And so that, that's important. So men, I want to encourage you. Honor your wives. Honor, honor the mothers, not just one day out of the year. I'd also like to say, you know, in some ways I just feel unqualified. Who am I? I don't have the words. How can I fully understand or know what a mom actually goes through? The sacrifice, the love, the labor, everything that goes into being a mom, what do I know about that? Now, I will say I have a front row seat. I've got a front row seat. I see what my wife uh, does for me and for the kids and, and just how, uh, how much she loves us and, and blesses us. I see that. But at the same time, I, can't, I just you know, can't know the depths of that. I don't want to act like I do and like somehow I, I recognize all that. But I just want to say thank you to my wife and thank you to the moms for, for how you serve so faithfully. And I want to really praise the community of moms in this church. Because we have something pretty special here. I see how the, the moms love one another and encourage one another. And you know, sometimes there can be real challenges in, in community, especially outside of the church. You know, that I see other communities of, of moms and I kind of see how there is uh, a constant pressure to be some kind of way in front of other moms. And then there's a judge, kind of a judgmentalism that goes on where moms are judging other moms. And that's just a terrible thing. And, I, and that's really not, doesn't happen here. I just see love, support, encouragement, and I praise God for that. And I just want to encourage you guys, keep doing that more and more. Realize that is a thing. It's important, and, and really embrace that. Amen? I just think it's a, it's a glorious thing. It honors God, and it blesses the body of Christ. And, you know, I just want to exhort you further. Don't grow weary in doing good, the Bible says. Just keep moving forward in Jesus' name and God's strength. I know it's hard, it's exhausting, it's thankless so, so much of the time, but I just want to encourage you, don't lose heart in doing good. Just keep moving on, keep moving forward in Jesus' name. God is pleased and God blesses that. And I would encourage spiritual mothers in here, you know. I, I'm, you know, I love my parents, and I know that they did the best that they could for me. But honestly, it was spiritual parents that have made me the man that I am today. And I thank God for the spiritual mothers in my life that have impacted me tremendously and have taught me much about what it means to honor a woman and to, to, to be, you know, uh, how, to, how to treat a, a lady. And, and, you know, I think so much of, of what I know about how to care and love for my own wife has come from the wisdom of spiritual mothers who have invested in me as a son in the faith. So I just want you to understand how important that is right and so within the body of Christ we need many mothers and so I praise God that we have that here and so I would love to pray for you if I may and for those who are watching from home as well so if you would please join me in a in a word of prayer dear heavenly father we love you so much and we we delight ourselves in you God and we thank you that you are our loving heavenly father Thank you that every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. And I thank you for motherhood that is a gift to humanity. And I thank you for the mothers in Calvary Napa. I thank you for uh, their faithfulness to their families, their faithfulness to you. And there is no such thing as a perfect mom or a perfect dad. Obviously, we know this. But, Father, I thank you nonetheless uh, for, for the parents here, the mothers here, that, uh, that really take seriously the duty that you have called them to. And, Father, I pray a very special blessing over the, 
over the mothers. Please encourage them today. I pray that today they would be blessed, that they would be showered uh, with, with blessing and praise, and that they would be served, God, and that they would feel the love. I pray, God, above all that they would know your love and that they would know that you are pleased with them, Father, and that they would be strengthened and encouraged and blessed and filled with good things, God, and that they would be able to continue on and persevere. And I pray that for them to be spiritual mothers as well, spiritual mothers as well in the, in the body of Christ. And I thank you, God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Sorry, I always do this. Children's ministry, you are released. Kids, you may go. It was good, they need to hear that. All right, turn with me, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to pick up in verse 13. Now, I debated on if I was even going to cover this text today, because I'll be honest, it's kind of an awkward text to teach on Mother's Day, you know, it's uh, satanic opposition to the work of God, you know, that's the, the title, and so um, my prof one of my professors, who I love dearly, I, I listen to a lot of his content on YouTube from his church, and he has a message called, What is Satan Up To? And, I, I, and that, that's very, you know, a very real part of the text that we're in today. And so I thought, I'm going to check that out and, and see if I can glean something from that. And as he was opening up, he was acknowledging all the mothers and honoring them. It turns out that was his message for Mother's Day last year. And he said, I, I recognize this is kind of a bizarre message on Mother's Day. And I thought, okay, Lord, I think that's probably a confirmation of some sort that uh, I'm kind of in the same boat here a year later to the day. And so I'll, I'll you know, in faith, I'm going to just keep moving our way through First Thessalonians. That's what we do. You know, we go book by book, verse by verse through the Word of God. And so such is the case. That's where we are at today. And as I said, it's a pretty straightforward title, Satanic Opposition to the Work of God. That's exactly what's happening here. And this text opens up with... Um, Paul rejoicing, rejoicing in the work of God happening in that place. And it, the text closes with Paul rejoicing, rejoicing in the return of Christ and how that church, the, the church there in Thessalonica, would be his cause for boasting and celebrating in the, in the return of the Lord. And so it opens and, and closes with, with celebration, and he, he acknowledges the fact that there's a battle that is going on all the time that there is opposition that is to be expected. And he actually pinpoints in the chapter where that opposition is coming from. And so I believe in verse 18, he says, Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. And so there's a lot of opposition that takes place in this text, and at that point Paul really, really draws that out. Here, here is the root. Here is the cause of this opposition. So before we even start to get into the, the introduction in the text itself, I just wanted to kind of share that with you to help us track a little more carefully with this as we work our way through it. Now, earlier in the week, this week, um, Jess messaged me and said, you know, the girls dumped your protein powder in the toilet. And what they didn't dump in the toilet, they filled up with water, with toilet water. And so I was not surprised by that. I remember that morning, I left it out, and the thought crossed my mind, you know they can open that. You should put it up. And I didn't. I forgot. And so I wasn't surprised. And I went to the, to the, uh, I went to the vitamin shop and got another container. And I was telling the, the guy at the register, pretty young guy, what had happened, and the look on his face was just priceless. He was dumbfounded. He was like, why would they do that? And I was like, 
because they do bad things every chance they get, man. They're like two and four years old. Why would they not do that, you know? And so, honestly, as Christians, we can be like that sometimes when opposition hits, when difficulty, calamity, resistance comes. We're, we're somehow like that kid in the vitamin shop, right? Uh, you know, why? I, I, wouldn't, I didn't expect that, right? And we shouldn't be. We should not be shocked. In fact, we should be expecting that. We should be expecting difficulty, opposition, resistance, hardship, because the Bible is very clear. The Bible is very clear that we can expect that in this world. Jesus said that in this world you will have tribulation, but that we as Christians can rejoice because He has overcome the world. Amen? Amen. Jesus has overcome. And so in this world, we're going to have opposition, resistance, difficulty, hardship, because we know who the ruler of this world is, right? And who might that be? Satan. And that's exactly what Jesus calls him. In John chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. And so Jesus called him that. So this is a corrupt, fallen world system. That, that we are living in. And it is led by Satan, who is the ruler of this world, so to speak. It's, it's you know, only in as much as God allows him. Obviously, he is not, he is not uh, omnipotent. He is not sovereign. Only God is that. But nonetheless, Satan is described as the ruler of this corrupt, fallen world, this kingdom of darkness. The Bible says that we are living in and that we were once a part of. Well, we're no longer of this world. We've been saved out of this world system. We've been saved from the, from the king of darkness, as it were. And so now we're on opposing sides. There are two kingdoms that are opposite each other, and we are no longer in the kingdom of darkness led by the, the king of darkness. We are in the kingdom of light. And so there's a real war going on here. There is a real opposition that happens. And you know, just because we've changed addresses, just because we've had a change of address, doesn't mean that we don't have to deal with that old landlord still. Right? And so, there is still very much a battle that exists. In fact, there was a time when we were doing Satan's bidding, and, and he really didn't need to mess with us. He was very content to have us be in our blindness and our rebellion against God. But when God called us out of darkness into light, Satan became, in a very real way, our enemy, our accuser, our opposer. And so, for starters, we need to realize that we have an enemy of our souls. We need to know that. I think many of us do know that. I think many of us don't know just how serious it is, and I think many of us don't really live in that reality. I've talked about this before, you know, where I'm, where I'm from. It's that old devil. He is just the problem in any and every single situation. It's just kind of embedded into the culture, that old devil, that old devil. And then you get into Christianity, and there are people that are like that. I mean, it's always satanic. It is always the devil. It's like, oh, my shoe's untied. Satan, you know? <laughs> and so we can go too far. We can go too far with that, right? But the Bible is very clear. We have an enemy, and his name is Satan. And he is an accuser of the brethren. And the Bible describes him as a roaring lion. And I think that's a fitting description, because if you ever thought about what a lion, what it lo would look like for a person to be mauled by a lion, I mean, it's a gruesome, horrific type thing. And that, that's what Satan wants to do to our lives. He wants to maul us and tear us apart and destroy our lives. That's what he wants to do. His objective is to oppose God and to frustrate God's people in every point. Satan's objective is to render God's people ineffective. Nobody can snatch us out of the hand of God. Nobody can separate us from the love of God, not even Satan himself. But he can take us out of the game, as it were. He can tempt us into a place of sin and uselessness for the Lord, as it were. And that's his objective. That's his goal. You know, Jesus told Peter, Peter, Satan has requested to sift you like wheat. 
That's uh, if you know anything about you know the the process of raising wheat and and grain, you would um, you would take the wheat and grind it, and what you have is the chaff and the wheat. And so to separate the two, you take a a pitchfork or a winnowing fan, they would call it, and scoop it up and throw it up into the air, and the wind would blow away the chaff, and what you would be left with is the grain. So that's the idea, and so that's what Jesus said Satan wanted to do to Peter. He wants to sift you, man. He wants to pulverize you and just, you know, separate you, as it were. And uh, Peter, you know, you would think he would be like, well, you told him no, right? Uh, he didn't. He said, I prayed for you. I pray that your faith would not fail and that when you return, you would strengthen your brothers. And so Satan's objective is to frustrate, is to sift, is to render us ineffective for the Lord. And it's a delegated authority. He has to ask permission. And sometimes God will give him that permission. And we'll talk about that a little later. But we have to know that that's what he is out to do. He's extremely crafty. We see the way that he, he comes after Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 with the temptations there in the wilderness. Very crafty. And he, uh, we can be incredibly naive, quite honestly. You know, uh, sometimes I think we, we really just fail to realize the severity of the situation and the kind of enemy that we have in Satan and in his demonic forces. And somehow we just think that uh, we're good, you know, that we're invincible, and that his forces are no match for our steadfastness. We, we live that way. We act that way. And so we have to be very careful about that. And he can also be very seductive. You know, I doubt that he is, uh, has, is red with, with horns and a pointy tail and a pitchfork like he's often depicted. And in fact, it, the Bible says, no wonder he disguises himself as an angel of light. And so, so often when Satan comes at us, he's going to come in a way that's very appealing, in a way that is very neutral. You know, we're not going to automatically perceive that this is, you know, wicked or the forces of, dar of darkness are at work here. And so we just have to recognize this. And um, as I said, the mistake that we often make is just not recognizing how present and unrelenting he and his forces can be. In Luke chapter 4, there's this extra little detail given there in the temptations of Jesus there in the wilderness that after Jesus withstood the temptations, Satan fled, but he was, he, he was looking for an opportune time. He was going to come back at an opportune time. Just a little, little phrase kind of tucked away there. That is very significant. Satan was defeated there, but he wasn't done. He was coming back. He was just looking for the opportune moment. And so that's the way that it is in our lives. He's, uh, he's, he's not going to come when we're at the top of our game. You know, when, when we're just in, in tune with the Lord and we are doing our, our devos and we're, we're consistent and, you know, we're just in that sweet place with the Lord, the enemy's going to wait. He's crafty, he's clever, and he's going to come when we are at our weakest point, right? So we have to realize we've got an enemy like that. We've got an enemy like that. And so for us, it's important to know that. Now, Paul did not make that mistake. Paul knew. Paul knew. He experienced much opposition, and he knew exactly where it was coming from. And that is what we see in our text today. God called Paul to his service, but that did not mean that Paul would not receive opposition. And the people that responded to Paul's ministry would likewise receive opposition. However, despite the opposition, God's word and work would prevail. Because our confidence is in God, amen? amen. And God is faithful. And God is steadfast. And when we cling to Him, we have hope and we have confidence in Him. And He's going to see us through to the end. But we must recognize that there is a satanic opposition against the work of God and the Word of God. And if you're a Christian, then that's a very real part of the life that you live, that we live. In our service and our worship and our obedience to Jesus. As long as we're living in this world, it's just a very real part of it. It's a part of the battle. So with that... We'll get into our text. So we've got four points. And the first one, we're going to see, Paul rejoices in the power of God and the effectiveness of His Word. So we have an enemy. We have an enemy that hates God and hates God's people, hates God's Word. But God's Word is powerful. 
It is effective, and it's going to accomplish what God intended it to accomplish, and nothing can stay God's hand. Amen? Absolutely nothing can thwart God's purposes. Our God is in heaven. He does exactly what He wants, and absolutely nothing can stop that, not even Satan himself and all of his dark forces. And so Paul rejoices in this. Paul rejoices in that. So verse 13, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So he said, we thank God unceasingly. Paul thanks God. And he says, for this reason. What is the reason that Paul thanks God? Well, he tells us. He says, because you received the word of God. You received the word of God. And Paul acknowledges that their having received the preaching of the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God was directly attributed to God Himself. That was God's doing. It was God working in their hearts and in their lives, in their midst, that caused them to be so very receptive to the message that Paul brought to them. And he thanked God for it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're told that that there's a blindness that exists in this world. It's a satanic blindness. That the eyes of, of humanity are blinded in Satan and that it takes God breaking through that blindness. It says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. He says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And so it says, look, there is a blindness in this world. People are dead in their trespass and sin. They're separated from God. They're blinded to the gospel of Christ. To them, that is a foolish thing. It is a foolish message, right? But then Paul says that God breaks through that blindness with a glorious radiant light, the light of His glorious grace. In verse 6, he says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, and who has shown in our hearts to give light, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Only Paul could pull the gospel out of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. That is amazing to me. And he said, there is a blindness that exists in this world, a satanic blindness in this world that is anti-Christ in opposition to God and those who are subject to this world and to this world ruler who are blind. God breaks through that blindness. He shines His glorious light in the face of Jesus Christ in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that blindness is broken and they came to a saving knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Paul starts by acknowledging that that was God's doing. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that when I came to this church and preached the gospel, you broke through that blindness. You broke through that blindness and you opened their hearts and their eyes to the glories of Christ, to the majesties of Christ, to the excellencies of Christ. And they were stunned. They were struck to the heart by the glories of Christ. And he said that you recognize that it was not our word, but it was the very word of God. See, they were the messengers. They were the messengers of God's word. But the the church there in Thessalonica, they knew. They knew this is more than just the words of men. And you know that. When you hear the gospel and you hear the word of God, you are confronted with the fact that this is not merely, you know, concocted by men. This is the Word of God. It comes from the living God. And such was the case for them. They knew that it wasn't just some message that was put together by Paul and his, his uh, co-laborers there. It was the very Word of God, and they received it as such. And he said, "In this Word is working powerfully in you who believe. And once you believe the Word of God and the Word of God begins to change you from the inside out, it begins to affect you, you know. You know that you know. And your confidence in the Word of God only grows, amen? Because such is the nature of God's Word. God's Word is His instrument of salvation. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? 
the Word of God. You heard the Word of God. You heard the message concerning Christ. And you believed. You had faith in that. You trusted that message. You looked to Christ. God broke through the blindness with the glorious Gospel of Jesus Christ. And you believed. You trusted. You were saved and you were changed. God says of His Word in Jeremiah 23-29, "...is not My Word like a fire." says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. I love that. God's Word is like a fire. It's like a hammer. It's like a hammer. God's Word is a sword. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's Word is living. It's powerful. You read it, and you know that this is not merely words on a page. This isn't just a history book. It is God-breathed truth that has been delivered to us, preserved for us, and illumined to us by the Holy Spirit of God. And we know that we know that it is the very Word of God. It is the Word that saves us, and it is the Word that changes us. Amen? That was Paul's confidence, and Paul rejoiced in that. Even in the midst of satanic blindness, God's Word is more powerful, and God can break through with that hammer, with that fire, with that sword. God does that. And so Paul rejoiced in the power of God and the effectiveness of His Word. The next thing we see here, number two, we're going to now see the church's resolve to follow Christ despite opposition. So Paul rejoiced, and now we see the church's resolve. The church's resolve. Verse 14, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea uh, Judea and Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things which your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. So Paul says, look, your experience has been the same as the Christians in Judea, back over in Jerusalem, in Israel. This is up in um, Macedonia, right, over in Europe. And he said, your experience is just like those where the church first started there in Jerusalem. As they suffered great persecution from their countrymen there, so have you. Because we know that the hostility, hostility in Thessalonica was hot. And that there was great opposition. There was persecution not only from the Jews, but also from the pagan mobs there. And so he says, look, you're suffering just like the Jews have over in Judea. He says in verse 15, speaking of those Judeans, he said that they killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. And they have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men. So Paul, speaking of this persecution that happened over there in Jerusalem and Israel, he says, look, they have a long track record of this. First, they killed their prophets. And Stephen, the martyr there in Acts chapter 6, he says that very thing. He says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your father not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one. The prophets were oftentimes killed by those whom they came to prophesy to. Uh, Tradition has it that Isaiah was actually sawn in half uh, by, um, gosh, which king was it? Hezekiah's son. Anybody remember? Huh? Manasseh. Very good. Manasseh had Isaiah sawn in two. Uh, Now, Manasseh came to faith in God later. It was a radical repentance and change. Uh, He went from being one of the worst kings to one of the best kings. But can you imagine that? And Isaiah was one of the greatest preachers of of the Messiah, of the Christ, and all of the Old Testament when you look at the prophecies of Christ in the book of Isaiah. But that that was what it was. It was not a very glorious thing to be a messenger of God, to be a preacher of of God's truth in the Old Testament. Oftentimes the prophets were killed. And then, not only that, they killed the Lord Jesus, as Paul says here. In Acts chapter 2, Peter says of Jesus, and Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death the Lord of glory. 
their own king, their own Messiah came. And just as they killed the prophets who foretold the Messiah, they killed their own Messiah. And Paul says, now they're persecuting us. And so that long history continues on. Now they were killing God's messengers after Christ. Those who were, who were pointing back to the fact that God's Son had come and that He had brought salvation to the world. Now they were being persecuted. And he says that they are displeasing to God. That doesn't say they're not doing God any service here. And that's just the thing. A lot of times they thought that they were. You know, a lot of times Saul himself, Paul, Saul, when he was persecuting the church, he thought he was serving God. He thought he was being faithful to God. And he says they're displeasing to God and they're contrary to all men. That is to say not only were they opposing God, but they were keeping men back from the kingdom. They were keeping men back from the kingdom. And Jesus speaks to the same thing of the scribes and the Pharisees. In Matthew 23, 13, he says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. So these were hypocrites. They were not lovers of God. They were haters of God. They were fakes. And not only were they not going into the kingdom, they were hindering others from going too. Would-be followers. And so that's always been a real problem. And Paul says that about these persecutors. So this is next level deception here. This is next level satanic blindness. When you think you're serving God and you're actually opposing God, blaspheming God, and then keeping other people from coming to God. That's heavy, is it not? That was the kind of opposition that they were up against here in the church. That was the kind of satanic opposition that they had to deal with. Verse 16 it says, they're forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. He said, they hinder our ability to speak forth the gospel and affect hindering people from hearing the glorious message of eternal life. And he says, they, they fill up the measure of their sins. It's literally piling up to the maximum limit. Their sins are just piling up, piling up. Those who are hindering the work of God from going forth. And he says, but the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. So just as their sins are piling up, the cup of God's wrath is filling, filling, filling until it's overflowing and it's going to be poured out on the nations. And Paul says that the wrath has already come upon them. And I would suggest this is just a a further hardening, hardening and blindness. That is one of the worst judgments of God. When people reject God, when they harden their hearts against God, when they in their own blindness blaspheme God and try to hinder his other, God gives them over. That is the worst thing that can possibly happen. And they're only confirmed, hardened in their hardness and their blindness against God. I think that's the kind of judgment that Paul is talking about here. So having said all of that, with that kind of opposition, that kind of persecution, that kind of hatred, and that kind of blindness, and I would suggest to you all of that is very satanic, that is, a, that is all satanic, they continue to walk with Christ faithfully. They continued on. They persevered in the faith. I need you to, to lean in. Hear me on this. This is such an important principle for us as Christians because it's hard, isn't it? Don't you just feel like it's hard? It's exhausting, is it not? So often, and we can get discouraged and we can want to give up. And Satan is a tempter and he wants to whisper in our ear. And he would, he would want us to think that opposition somehow means that God is not in it. They could have been tempted to think that. You know, maybe this following, following Jesus, maybe this Apostle Paul, maybe all this was all bad. Maybe, maybe this was not true. Maybe all of this opposition is just, just you know, basically confirming that, that God's blessing is not upon us. They could have gone there with that, and it's easy for us to go there with that. But they did not do that. They persevered in the faith. They did not chalk opposition up to automatically meaning closed doors or a lack of God's blessing. Right? Sometimes God calls us right into the hostility right into the fire, right into the opposition and the resistance. And we need to prayerfully be led of the Lord, led by the Spirit in those situations, and to persevere on in the midst of those difficulties. 
You know, I would suggest to you if that as a Christian we did not have opposition, that we didn't have resistance, hostility, that would be something to be suspicious about. You know, because if you're where God would have you be, and if you're doing what God would have you do, then you have a real enemy. Satan does not like that. And Satan is going to try to thwart that. He's going to try to stop that. And so honestly, for the Christian, we celebrate, we rejoice when it gets crazy because we're like, man, we must be doing something right, you know? I mean, there's times when I know that me and the pastors are, you know, we're going to go off to a, a pastor's conference and I just know God is going to move in a very special way and refresh and encourage us in Him and give us just a, a great, you know, vision for the future because all hell breaks loose before we go there. You know what I mean? You ever experience that in your own life? You can almost know when God's going to do something awesome when, when it goes very badly leading up to it, all right? Because the enemy is trying to stop that. And so we don't want to assume that opposition means that God's blessing is not there. We should in some ways be concerned when there is not opposition or difficulty happening, when the enemy is not uh, overtly trying to oppose us. And they didn't question the goodness and the faithfulness of God in the midst of it. That's another real temptation. Satan would have us do that. God's not really good. God doesn't really love you. Why would God do that? Why would God allow that to happen? And those are real things that go through our minds. And, and it frightens me. You know, I've had those kinds of thoughts come through my mind before. I think, I've, I, read, I remember in a book, uh, this author said it would be better to say there is no God than to say that he's an ugly God or an unloving God or a God that is not good. And that's exactly what the enemy wants us to do. And that's what he did in the garden, is it not, to, to Eve? Did God really say that when you eat, you're going to die, you're not going to die? Okay, so God lied to you. And secondly, God knows that you're going to be like him. So God had ulterior motives. He didn't want what was best for you. He wanted to hold you back. He wanted to keep you from enjoying the good things in life. So that's the tactic of Satan. We see it right there in the garden, and we see it again with Satan and the, and the temptations there in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. And we, we, we have to know that. So when temptation comes, when difficulty comes, we need to not automatically, you know, assume that God's not in it. And we also need not question God's goodness and God's faithfulness and God's character. They didn't do that. You know, we may often wonder why God allows certain difficulties into our lives. And I think that's very normal. And that's okay. And it's good for us to be honest about that because God already knows. It's one of the things I love about the fact that God knows everything. I can't hide from Him, so I shouldn't even try. It really removes a lot of pressure, doesn't it? I can't pretend to think or feel or be any other way. God knows. Except for when I'm inside of a room and He can't see through the ceiling, right? I'm just kidding. But God can always see and He knows, and so we can just be honest with God. We can be real. And the Bible says God knows our frame, that we are dust. From dust we have come, to dust we will return. And so uh, we have a sympathetic, a faithful, compassionate high priest who has been tempted in every way except he did not sin. And so we can be honest when we have those kinds of struggles, fears, failures, doubts. But you know, I would suggest to you that while Satan is tempting us, and that's what he's doing, he's tempting us to cause us to fall, to doubt, to sin, to, to defect, God is testing us. And these are two very different things, and you need to know that. There is a testing that is not good, uh, but there is a testing that is good. And the Bible uses this language. God tests us, wanting to show us what's really in there. We say we believe these things, and we have a pretty good, I think, uh, you know, a pretty good idea of where we're at until the heat gets turned up, until opposition comes, until hardship and difficulty comes. Then all of a sudden, man, we lose our religion real quick, real quick, right? And it's always, it's a really telling thing when that happens, and God does that. That's a gift from God. It doesn't feel like it at the time. But God will test us to show us where we are really at. We need to be aware of that. Take note of how you respond and react to difficulty. When you get offended, uh, when, when you know, any, any unpleasant thing comes into your life, when that cup gets bumped, what comes out of the cup? 
right? What's in there? Well, God tests our hearts, and He reveals that. And then God purifies us. That's, that's another aspect of testing. Testing the authenticity of something. When you test a precious metal and you, you melt it down and the impurities rise to the top, the dross, and then it's, it's uh, taken out, what you're left with is, is something more pure. And that is a very real part of the testing process. And God does do that. But God does not tempt us. James chapter 1 is clear about that. God cannot be tempted by sin, nor does He ever tempt anybody else. But God does test us. And sometimes God, I think, will allow Satan to sift us just so that we can see what's really in there. Really test us. He gives us an opportunity to do the right thing. Have you ever failed a test? Well, praise God, He'll give you another chance. And another one, and another one, and another one. And so sometimes I'm like, man, Lord, you know, I, I've dropped the ball there. And I'm like, would you give me another opportunity? He will. In fact, he's going to keep on until you get it right, you know. And that's kind of a scary thing, honestly. But that's a very real part of it. And so we need to be able to distinguish between the two, between testing and temptation. It's, it's kind of like how the enemy condemns and the Holy Spirit convicts. The enemy would want to get in your ear and be like, you're terrible, you're a loser, you can't do this, who are you? You know, you fake, you hypocrite. That's, that's, that's the enemy getting in there. And what that does is that drives us away from God, causes us to try to back off and, and retreat. The Holy Spirit convicts us when we sin, when we sin. There's that, that gentle nudging. You don't have to live like that anymore. Why did you do that? That's not pleasing to the Lord, and you know that... that you shouldn't have done that. And it pricks our heart. And that drives us to God. Oh, God, I'm sorry. You know, Lord, I repent. Forgive me. You know, I want to do better than that. So that's conviction. And so God, by His Holy Spirit, convicts us. The enemy condemns us. God tests our hearts to reveal to us and to purify us. But the enemy tempts to try to trip us up, to try to take us out, to try to render us ineffective. And so we have to be aware of the enemy's schemes. And number three, point three, Paul's recognition that the root of the opposition is spiritual. Paul recognizes that. Verse 17, he says, but we brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. He said, however, even though we have been driven out of your midst, we were all the more compelled to see you again. We wanted to see you so badly. You know, it's been suggested that maybe some people in the church were trying to accuse Paul and say, you know, Paul doesn't really love you guys. Paul just left as soon as stuff got, got hard and he hasn't even come back. Paul doesn't really care. And Paul's saying to the contrary, I love you deeply. I have this unshakable burden, and we have wanted so badly to come back to you, he says, but we have been hindered. Paul declares his fervent desire to see them, but his delay was for a very specific and real reason, and he says it in verse 18 here, therefore we wanted to come see you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. He says, our desire has been to come to you, Yet we have been hindered. And Paul went right to the root of the opposition. Right to the root. It was Satan. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul says that's where the battle lies. Our enemy is not physical, he is spiritual. We have a spiritual enemy. We do not wrestle or war in the flesh. We have to stand against the wiles of the devil, and we have to realize that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. That is huge, Christian. You've got to know that. You've got to know that. The root of the opposition is spiritual. Spiritual, and Paul knew that. Now, Paul's hindrance most likely came from people. When he said he was hindered, he was probably hindered by people. Persecution on all sides. But these were people motivated ultimately by Satan himself and the forces of darkness. 
Satan uses people to frustrate and tempt other people. I'm sure many of us in here have already figured that out. Satan uses people. I think more than anything else, Satan uses people. You know, when Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him, a lot of people think he's talking about his eyes, some infirmity in his eyes, and that he couldn't see very well. Um, but some believe that that's actually talking about a person, a messenger of Satan, and a false teacher who was especially problematic and creating all kinds of issues, and who was just a real thorn in Paul's side. And uh, I, could, I could see that. You know, in Acts chapter 16, there was that demon-possessed girl that just kept following and shouting after Paul, these are the servants of the Most High God, incessantly for like days. And no doubt the enemy was using her to just create a, I mean, who wants to be endorsed by a demon anyways, right? <laughs> and so John chapter 13, we're told that Satan entered into Judas and then in Matthew chapter 16, when P, uh, Jesus said that he was going to go to the cross, Peter came up and said, no, you will not. Far be it from you. You are not going. You're not going to die. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God, but of men. And so it was as if in that moment he's saying, you don't know what influence you are being influenced by right now. And you're, you are not being mindful of the things of God. Jesus had a road, a hard path he had to walk. And Peter was trying to, I think, unwittingly, maybe by the influence of Satan himself, get him off that path. And Jesus saw right through that and said, get behind me, Satan. And so recognizing that Satan uses people. So I would say that opposition that the, the Thessalonians were experiencing there by their fellow, fellow countrymen, satanic. Satanic persecution and opposition. And Paul realized that the opposition that he was experiencing was coming from people who were motivated by Satan. You know, we need to keep in perspective that we have a common enemy, folks. We have a common enemy, and it is not each other. We fight against each other a lot of times. And in the home, even. Husbands and wives, you know, can really go at it. And then you've got to just stop and realize we're on the same team. You know, you're not my enemy. I'm not your enemy. We have an enemy in Satan, and we have to team up together to fight that enemy. You know, Satan wants to divide, conquer, cause us to fight against each other, and he's been doing that, man. Over the last year, he has done that. I just consider how much Satan has been involved in everything that has transpired over the past year, right? Right? And so we need to be aware of that. Satan uses people, and we need to, to be cognizant of that. And we also need to realize that we are on the same team and that we are not each other's enemies. We have a common enemy that we have to fight against. And we need not let Satan get a foothold. We need to not let Satan get in and get us tied up in a, in a knot, in a pretzel, because he does that, and he has done that. In fact, Paul says that in Ephesians. Don't give place to the devil. You know, don't give the devil an opportunity to get you bitter and to get you isolated and to get you in a place where you have unforgiveness in your heart and you're holding grudges because you've been offended, right? That's, that's a foothold. That's, Satan, that's like having your foot in a trap. You have been caught in, in a snare and now you can't get loose because he got you. And so we have to watch out for that. And honestly, I have to say, this has happened in the church over this last year because of much of what has happened with all the protocols and the, the banning of indoor services. And just all, you guys know, we've all been at, going through this together. And we've seen schisms and we've seen different groups that have emerged. And I've talked about this already. You know, I've talked about... Uh, and I've warned people when, when we got overly political and, and, you know, I've talked about that kind of stuff before. But honestly, and this is crazy to me because there's a pastor here in NorCal. I'm a part of this server, all the Calvary pastors in the Bay Area. And he sends out blogs frequently. And he was laying out the scenario and it was the same in every single church. That you have these different factions that have arisen. You have people who feel like, 
the government's got their hands too much in here, and they're, try, they're telling us that we should be doing these things, and we should not. We should not be separating. We should not be having to wear the mask, so on and so forth. And they get mad because the church basically, you know, caved to the man, right? And then you got other people who are like, we should be doing these things, and what's wrong with these other Christians because they're not taking it more seriously? And then there's this, these, you know, us against them, and, and that has been going on. And, and there's like two, three, four other groups, honestly, but that seemed to be the biggest ones, and it's still lingering to this day. It still festers to this very hour. There are still people that are mad, mad at other people because they didn't take the protocol seriously enough, or that, you know, I mean, just on and on it goes, and I, I just say that to say, that's a problem. That's a foothold. That's a foothold. we got to move on, folks. That was yesterday. I'm worried about today. I want to serve the Lord today. Uh, yeah, I'm a mess up. I ha- I'm sure I have not handled myself or, or led as well or done everything as good as I could have done, and guess what? I never will, but i got to keep pressing on in Jesus' name for Jesus' fame, and you do too. And we cannot let the enemy get us in a snare and a foothold where now we're mad at each other because you voted a certain kind of way or because you did this or you didn't do that. Man, no. The enemy's got us all twisted up. We can't do that. Man, we got to break free from that foothold and we got to move forward and, and serve and worship Jesus and love and serve each other. Amen? Amen. And so we have to be careful for that. All right, last point, final point. Paul's rejoicing in the return of the Lord for the Thessalonians. So Paul starts with rejoicing and he ends with rejoicing. Verse 19, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For you are our glory and joy. So Paul is affirming his love. He says, We love you and we are so very proud of you. And it is because of you that we can rejoice at the coming of the Lord. When the Lord returns, he can say, look at that church. Look at the fruit of our labor. Look at how they have stood the test of, and they have been steadfast in Christ. And what we see here is that Paul is expressing his confidence that despite the opposition, they will stay the course. And when the Lord returns, they will still be standing and they will be Paul's crown of rejoicing. See, that is a testimony of God's faithfulness and power right there. That is a testimony to the unstoppable nature of God's Word. When God's Word came, you heard it, you believed it, you were changed by it. When opposition came, you stood strong, you did not falter, you didn't question God, you didn't turn from God, you knew exactly where this was coming from. And on that glorious day when the Lord returns, you will be there by God's grace and the power of His Spirit, steadfast, and you will be our cause for boasting and rejoicing on that glorious day. So that's the confidence that we have, folks. Despite opposition, despite difficulty and hardship, our confidence is in the unstoppable nature of our God and His Word. Amen? Amen. Nothing's going to stop Him. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, regardless of hostility, opposition, resistance, difficulty. Can't stop him. Cannot stop him. We need to remember that. We need to remember that although Satan is a roaring lion, he is a lion on a leash, folks. He is a lion on a leash. He can only go so far. He can only do so much. He has to have God's permission, right? And so he is a defeated foe. He was defeated at the cross of Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, it is finished, He poured out His life to the death. He gave up His life there on the cross. He suffered horrific things for us, the just for the unjust. He died on that cursed tree in our place. And then He rose again from the dead, setting us free. The Bible says that He led captivity captive He set the captivity free. He brought peace and joy and hope to the brokenhearted. Amen? Jesus conquered Satan at the cross. He overthrew death and and the chains of hell and, and the power of Satan. All of that was just trampled, demolished at the cross for those who trust Christ, who call upon His name, who are called out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of glorious light. 
we have that confidence and that hope. And if you, if you have heard the gospel message, if you have heard that God saves sinners through Christ Jesus, that it's a free gift of God, there's nothing we could do to earn it or deserve it, but you know that you need it because you know that you've sinned against God and that you're not right with Him and that if you were to die today, you would go to hell. You know that. If you know that, if God is breaking through, shining through right now with the glorious gospel and you know that you need Jesus, call upon His name. Trust Him. Say, Jesus, I need you. I believe you. You're the Son of God. You died for me. You rose again from the grave and I believe in you. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from my sins. I want to walk with you. I want to follow you. Then you will be set free. You will be born again. You will be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And God will see you through to the very end. And you know that one day you will stand there and you will see Him face to face. And He will say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because of what Christ has done for you on the cross. Amen? Amen. That is our confidence. That is our hope. And that is our rejoicing. So don't grow weary in doing good, folks. Satan may want to tempt you. He may want to discourage you. He may want to distract you. He may be wearing you down. You may feel like you just can't go another moment. Persevere in Jesus' name. Keep moving on because God is faithful. He loves you. He's got you. Reset your focus on Christ. Look unto Him, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Amen? Amen. Look unto Jesus Christ. And may He be your hope and your confidence and your ability to withstand the schemes of the wicked one. Let's pray. Father, we love You and we thank You so much for Your incredible mercy and kindness. We thank You so much that though we have an enemy, we're not ignorant of his schemes and devices. God, You have revealed His tactics to us through the Word and You've given us Your Holy Spirit so that we can withstand. God, help us to encourage one another, to pray for and bless one another. Help us, Lord God, to rejoice in Your steadfast love and that our confidence would be in You. Help us, Lord, to realize the root of opposition, that it is spiritual and that we cannot fight that fight physically. It happens through spiritual means. God, it happens through prayer. And Father, I pray, God, that we would continue to rejoice in You and the hope and the confidence that we have in You, that You will see us through to that glorious day when there will be no more opposition, there will be no more temptation, there will be no more failure, there will be no more doubt, there will be no more discouragement. We long for that day, we look for that day. And we thank You that You've given us Your Holy Spirit as a down payment, a guarantee that we will make it to that day. Praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.